Android loudspeaker. Some people have made it. You can build it sim simply as a summation of a coincident omni source and a dipole source. You know, a cardioid is nothing more than one half, which is an omni here, plus one half cosine alpha, which is a dipole. The two together give you the cardioid response. Could be built as a gradient speaker. You take two omni sources, space at some distance apart, and delay the electrical signal to one of the sources by T equals D over C. Makes you a gradient loudspeaker. Olson writes about these things. Or you can build it as a resistance box, and a number of people have done that. You have basically a closed box with slits in them or with openings, and the opening is covered with uh, usually with some cloth, and that uh, so you form a an, an, uh, resistive capacitive uh, low pass filter. The capacitor is a compliance of the air in the box, and the uh, covered slot is a resistance. The tricky thing is that that resistance has to be 411 uh, newton seconds per meter to the cubed, uh, which is uh, the free space uh, uh, impedance, acoustic impedance of free space. And that uh, you can do, uh, like I said, with, with cloths with certain weaves and densities there. But when you, if you want to do this for a woofer, where you have large air volumes movement, moving, it's very difficult to find a material that doesn't flop around, that stays linear, that is a linear flow resistor. Now, there are, I, I, when I looked into this, I found there is actually, in a totally different field, I looked in the field of chemical filters. You know, chemists have to filtrate uh, fluids and things. And they build filters that actually work in these resistance ranges with flow resistances. And the best that I found is uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a felt, a metal felt, which is basically m uh, metal sort of woven together that it looks like a felt. It's maybe this thick here. It lets air through. It's also used for filtration purposes, but also as, as lining and ducts. Or as a, uh, if you want to build a, uh, 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 a heater, which has a flame that covers a very large surface. So you have gas coming on one side, and you have a very uniform gas flow, controlled, reduced velocity flow on the other side. You get a very uniform, large uh, flame, you know, surface covered with flame. That thing works actually quite quite well for this type of application. But again, for, for woofer, you have to move large amounts of air, so that's a problem. So there, this one here is, is probably the best solution or the gradient. But this one here I've seen work, both of them I've seen working models. But basically I asked myself the question, what for? Is it really necessary to build a cardioid? It's basically a uh, dipole and, and uh, I haven't seen really advantages of that. Okay. So let's, let's just for a moment look at uh, my claim number two, that you have to have uniform polar response, that the spectrum of reflection should be uh, uh, the same like the direct sound. You place this loudspeaker symmetrically, and the ref reflection have to be delayed. And what are the current practices? You look at the typical loudspeaker today, 95% of the loudspeaker, I would say, are boxes. They are omni at low frequencies. They are forward directional at high frequencies. So they will not, they will not do what I'm talking to you about. Uh, you look at loudspeaker setups. Often by necessities, loudspeakers are put into corners against the wall. So that also is not a good thing. Uh, room treatments. People absorb sound because it supposedly dense the room. But rarely are these room treatment materials broadband. Uh, the, the, all these foam type things that work about maybe 800 hertz or so, but don't do anything at low frequencies. People put things on the floor, and uh, uh, that doesn't do much except at high frequencies, where probably the, the tweeter doesn't illuminate the floor much to begin with because it's a directional system. Uh, then we talk about room equalization, and these days with digital signal processing, and, and uh, since it seems so obvious that all you need to do is to equalize the, the sound at the listening position, 
uh, I take a very skeptical view of, of electronic room equalization. Because fundamentally, you are, you are dealing now with a processor between your ears, which has adapted over millions of years with a situation that you are trying to correct with DSP. And uh, so far, and, uh, we're not quite smart enough on, on how to approach this. And, and I, I feel uh, some confirmation in that, because when you look at the papers that are being written about room equalization, the different approaches that people use, the different algorithms, most of them empirically sort of derived that you said, well, we're experimenting, we're, we're trying. We don't really know yet. You know, there's some more or less successful commercial products out there, and all they will do, they will all change what you hear. But are they really getting to the optimum? Yeah, they, will, they can make improvements, I, I grant you that. And I have heard some of these systems there, but, but the, to me, the, the ultimate test is when, when I spend time with a system. If I can listen to it long term, over long periods of time, and not sort of feel, oh, I'm getting tired. I want to turn this thing off. I, I, something isn't right. I couldn't, couldn't tell you what it is. But I take that as an indication that my brain, something is working hard up there to correct or compensate for something that doesn't seem natural. Then I know something isn't quite right yet. And so far, most systems have struck me that, that like that, and, and that uh, includes also our surround systems, even though I've heard demos that were super impressive, but I've, uh, the majority of, of surround systems, I say, yeah, they're sort of maybe impressive for, for a little while, but then you say, it's not quite there. Uh, okay. Oh, and, and I should, of course, say recording techniques. That's one of the things that you find in, like, in a two-channel system. You become extremely aware of the recorded uh, uh, acoustics, the venue acoustics there, and whether that's a real acoustic or whether it's a synthesized acoustics, you know, whether there were too many microphones used, whether the whole space hangs together, and uh, usually I find live recordings do, uh, do a better job than, than studio recordings in this respect here. But recording the technique is certainly an important parameter. Uh, Two-channel stereo with surround sound, I just hinted at it. Uh, what you are missing in two channels is a real surround. Because even if you get a good sound stage, it is always in front of you. It may extend, it may extend beyond the loudspeakers depending on the recording there, but it's sort of in, in front of you in, in depth and height. It also has height. Uh, and I, I feel I'm, what I'm getting, and I've experimented with Ron quite a, quite a bit there, but I always go, after a while I say, well, it's not worth the effort, what I'm getting here. I get more believability if, if I listen just to two-channel stereo uh, get greater satisfaction, and that's sort of just a feeling type term. And it's, it's impressive in its simplicity, basically. If you can set it up properly, it's pretty hard to get much simpler than that. Okay, so that's the, the uh, uh, message here that I want to leave with you. Oops, why do I jump always to, okay. And, uh, so that's what I wanted to relate to you. Thank you for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, be happy to answer them, if I can.